And so this morning we're going to be looking at John 19 again, and we're just going to be continuing on this week and next week with the verses uh, that we've been going through in John 19. So uh, two short verses uh, today will be from John 19, verses 28 and 29. And so after Jesus spoke the words that we looked at last week to his mother and to his beloved disciple John, uh, the text says this, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. These words of Jesus, I thirst, may sound random at first glance, but they're not. Jesus used the language and imagery of water and thirst uh, throughout his ministry, and it's recorded throughout the Gospels, and what Jesus does is he connects the language of thirsting and water back through the Old Testament scriptures, which we're going to explore in depth this morning. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us because water is integral to our survival. We need lots of this stuff to survive. The human body needs liters of water every day so that we can function in a healthy manner. And we can only survive without water for a few days. Without it, dehydration will quickly settle in, causing extreme thirst, fatigue, and ultimately organ failure and death. When you don't drink water, you quickly go from feeling thirsty and sluggish on the first day to near death on the third day. So it's really, really serious. So we can see how Jesus' words, I thirst from the cross, were actually a cry of desperation. He was deprived of water for at least one day while he was being tortured and he was being beat and mocked and ridiculed. And then finally, when he was put on the cross, Jesus was completely dehydrated. And so part of the cause of his death was actually dehydration which the Gospel of John draws specific attention to. John connects for us thirsting and suffering in the life of Jesus. And this is the most important point that I'm going to make this morning and that John wants us to hear in these two verses in his Gospel. Jesus thirsts while he drinks down the cup of suffering. Jesus thirsts while he drinks his cup of suffering. And recall what Jesus said on the night of his betrayal just a couple of days previous. He said, I must drink the cup of suffering the Father has given to me. So Jesus knew from the foundation of the world, that is what he said, that he must suffer and that he must die. And inside of that suffering, he would thirst on our behalf. Jesus' saving mission took him all the way down to the bottom of the cup of suffering, where his final cry, one of his final cries from the cross was, Father, I thirst. And that experience in the Gospel of John is how the scriptures were fulfilled. That is 
part of the story of how the scriptures were fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Jesus is the climax of the covenant. Jesus is the very pinnacle of what the scriptures looked to and taught. But how and why? We need to un explore this and unpack this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of work backwards here as we look at the scriptures. So first, I want to look at the Gospel of John. So there's two other specific chapters in the Gospel of John where Jesus taught about water and thirsting. It's John chapter 4 and John chapter 7. For many of you, they will be very familiar passages. For some, it will be very new. But you need to make the connection here, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. John chapter 4. While Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he had this famous encounter with this woman who was just totally caught in a life of sin and everything was all messed up and disordered in her life. And Jesus came and he met her in her place of need. And what did he say? He said this, everyone who drinks of this water, they were putting down a bucket into a well that was dug deep into the ground. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this physical water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give, that's the key, that I give, will never thirst again. The water I give, says Jesus, will become in you a spring of water that wells up to eternal life. My water is a spring of water that leads to the life of the age to come. That is Jesus' water. And in the second passage, John chapter 7... Jesus comes teaching in the temple area in Jerusalem. So there's uh, Jews that have gathered from all over the world. And they've come for the Feast of Tabernacles. They would gather every single year at the temple in Jerusalem when it was still standing. And they would celebrate the Israelites wandering in the wilderness after they were delivered from Egyptian bondage, from slavery in Egypt. So they would come together and they would celebrate the Exodus event where God brought them out and they wandered in the wilderness. And so they would be thinking and they would be reading the scriptures about the, the wandering in the wilderness, the, the desert experience of God's people where they experienced a dryness, where they longed for water. They long to be filled not only uh, in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, in the wilderness. And it is at that, at that feast that Jesus stood up and cried out. That's what God, John's gospel says. He stood out, he stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Let them come to the living word. I am the one who fulfills Everything that was promised, everything that that event pointed to, the Exodus event, God's deliverance, it comes to me. Whoever believes in me, says Jesus, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus said this about the spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive. That is John's commentary that he gave after he quoted the words of Jesus. So what is, what is going on here? Jesus looks back to the Old Testament story, to the story of Israel and God's deliverance and God's promises, the promises that he even spoke to the prophets, that he would pour out his spirit. And Jesus says, if you want the living water, you need to come to me. And when the Spirit is poured out, it will come upon you and it will quench your spiritual 
thirst, not just your physical thirst. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's new covenant promise of life and salvation for all people of all nations, not just for the people of Israel. The people of Israel and God's encounter with them leads out to the world. And when Jesus comes to the cross and he cries out from the cross, I thirst, he speaks on our behalf and he fulfills our need. Jesus is the fountain head of living water, of the living water of the Holy Spirit that God pours out into our lives. But now, turn back to the cross for a moment, but now, on the cross, the fountain himself thirsts. Why does the fountain thirst? Jesus' cup of suffering leads him to a place of desolation where he is parched so that our spiritual thirst can be quenched. That's what's happening on the cross of Calvary. Having been stripped of his clothes by evildoers, Jesus clothes himself with the promises and the prophecies of Scripture. On the cross, the Word become flesh embodies God's Word. That's what Jesus does. And so, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you may recall that Jesus' suffering is linked to Psalm 22. Not only does Jesus quote Psalm 22, 1, which we looked at in depth a couple of weeks ago, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, 1. Jesus now appeals to verses 14 to 16 in Psalm 22. And he says this, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shear, like a, a, a piece of dried pottery. My tongue, it sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And then Jesus, he alludes not only to Psalm 22 in these verses, but he also alludes to Psalm 42. And here is a royal lament. So as Jesus, you know, he looks to the scriptures and he echoes the scriptures, we hear these words from Psalm 42. And I invite you to just this week meditate on these words. Make the connection between Psalm 22 and Psalm 42 and the Gospel of John, John chapter 19. John chapter 4, John chapter 7. Listen to these words. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember. I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession in the house of God. Remember John 7 when Jesus goes into the temple in the worshiping community and he cries out, Look to me for living water. 
I would lead them in the procession in the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festal. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Now turning again to his experience on the cross. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Why, O my soul, are you cast down within me? Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries, they taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Think about them screaming out to Jesus and taunting him while he was on the cross. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for again I shall praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm 42. Make the connection to Jesus' experience on the cross while surrounded by evildoers and their taunt of mockery. Where is your God, Jesus, you Messiah? Jesus prophetically declares, I thirst, I thirst. For the living God, not just for a drink in my experience of dehydration and death on the cross. Jesus cries out to his heavenly father while the, the earthly voice of accusation rains down on him. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Jesus says, no, I will not. I will not be swayed for the glory of the cross is his willing sacrifice as our substitute. The glory of the cross is his willing sacrifice as our substitute. He thirsts on your behalf so that your spiritual thirst will be quenched. That is what is happening on the cross for us. This is the work of Jesus. Which leads us finally to verse 29. The second verse that we're looking at this morning in John 19. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and they put it to his mouth. The hyssop branch is the second image that we need to consider here this morning as we bring together the thirsting and the suffering. Why the hyssop branch? Why does John draw attention to this? Consider Exodus 12. Consider the scriptures. Read it this week. The hyssop, a small bushy plant is used, it was used during the time of the Exodus. Remember what the Jewish people were celebrating when Jesus spoke of the living water. They were celebrating the deliverance from Egypt, 
from slavery. When Moses was bringing the people out on the night that he brought them out, on the night of the Passover, when the Passover lamb was slaughtered, the hyssop was used to sprinkle the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts of the Israelites' homes so that the Lord would pass over their home, the angel of death would pass over their home, and they would be delivered. And then they would be led out in the procession by Moses after the Passover. The Lord said in Exodus 12, and I quote, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. The blood that was put on the doorposts by the hyssop bush. So that when I see the blood, says the Lord, I will pass over you. And my plague of death will not fall on you to destroy you when I attack the land of Egypt. When God brings his righteous judgment for the evil that the Egyptian people and leaders were doing against the Jewish people. Fast forward to the cross of Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the true Passover lamb. He is the promised Messiah. He is the true deliverer. He is the deliverer of Israel. He is the new Moses. This is who Jesus is. And so when he hangs from the cross and the sour wine on the hyssop of God's new covenant is offered, it is offered in response to Jesus' words, I thirst. There is a moving from the old covenant to the new covenant when Jesus speaks these words from the cross. Consider Hebrews 9 as it reflects back on the gospel event and it reflects back on the Exodus event in scripture. Hebrews 9 says Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, the deliverance, since a death has occurred that redeems us from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus secured our eternal redemption by means of his own blood on the cross, offered once for all people at the end of the ages to put away sin by his own sacrifice. End quote. Go home this week and read Hebrews 9 and make the connection back through the Gospel of John to Exodus 12 and the story of God's deliverance. My friends, when we bring all of this together this morning, out of these two small verses, as, the God, as John reflects on the cross of Christ, we hear this good news being proclaimed. At the cross, our thirst-quenching Savior gives his life for the life of humanity. See the connection. Jesus, he thirsts while he suffers, and then he dies for you in your place and for our benefit. This is what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. Jesus, he sympathizes with us in our weakness, in our thirsting, in our place of desolation, in our wilderness experience. He sympathizes with us 
For he was tested in every respect as we are, yet he was without sin. He is the unblemished Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. Hallelujah and praise be to his name. So when you go through times of dryness, people of God, which you will, we will go through times of dryness. We know who we can turn to. We can turn to Jesus because he has been there for us and he is with us now. As I was reflecting on all of this amazing teaching in Scripture, all of these connections, it took me back to a time in my life in 2015. It was a very, very difficult time for me and for my family. In 2015, at the end of the summer, coming into the fall, we moved back to Ontario from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we lived for 10 years. I did ministry in Halifax, Nova Scotia for 10 years. It was at that point in time that we went through much difficulty and I personally entered into a wilderness experience. I had experienced a lot of uh, brokenness within the church. I experienced wounding uh, within the church, specific people. And I stepped back from ministry for two years. So I allowed my ordination to uh, fall and I just knew that I couldn't be in ministry at that point in time when I came back to Ontario. It was a parched land, and I struggled with my own sense of identity. I was full of self-doubt. I didn't know where my life was going. I didn't know where to turn, really. And I remember, and I wish I could be in person and be sharing this right now uh, instead of just standing in a room and looking at a camera like I'm doing right now. But I remember in my mind's eye on either end of the journey, uh, we had packed up all of our stuff and uh, we had sold our home and all of my things were in a moving truck and I went uh, to my house in Halifax for the last time that morning. And I remember sitting in the backyard and I uh, sat on a bench that I built in the backyard and I wept. Um, and I... I lamented and I mourned the losses and I knew in that moment that there was going to be a different season for me and I knew that it was going to be a very dry season and uh, that morning I jumped in the truck with my dad and uh, we we left and we started driving to Ontario and uh, we drove, uh, it took us a, a few days and we drove with my wife and my two kids and my mom and uh, we arrived in Oshawa and we put all of our stuff into a, uh, a storage unit and uh, that night after I got all my stuff unpacked, I was just totally bagged. And we went over to Julie's parents' house uh, to drop some stuff off. 
and I sat on uh, the couch of my in-laws and I was on the other side of the journey now and I sat down and again I just wept and I, I looked at my mother and father-in-law and I just said you know like I don't I don't know where this is going okay? I don't know where my life is heading and they just said you know Brad there's times when you have to just trust the Lord and you got to look to Christ and you don't know the path forward and thankfully my wife and my family and a couple of really good friends a couple of really good friends actually from out east who I still talk to a lot they surrounded me and they led me to the thirst quenching God they walked with me through a period of time and I'm talking about years I'm talking about a couple of years now after this where I had to work through a lot of things I had to go through a wilderness experience not for just a couple of days or a week but for like months on end and I had to seek the living water of the Holy Spirit the God who quenches my thirst and it was in the desert experience it was in the experience of thirsting and uh, in, in a real sense like almost abandonment you know not knowing where things are heading it was in that place that God met me and led me on and so I want to finish with a word to you out of my experience as I reflect on the scriptures this morning all of us can unexpectedly arrive in a time of wilderness wandering a wilderness place where we thirst spiritually emotionally or physically where we wonder how things are going to get where they need to go where and to whom do you turn and so in all humility I submit to you the answer this morning you turn to the fountainhead of your salvation the world and the voices in this world are going to tell you to go out in a hundred different directions and seek out a hundred different solutions to your problems but we have to say no we have to meet Jesus at the foot of the cross and we have to see there what it was almost impossible for people to see at that moment in time that this actually is the fountain this is the place where we receive the living water and we know that there is a next step to this story it's Jesus resurrection it's the new life that we have in him that is what we have to look to not only the crucified Christ who cried out I thirst but the risen Jesus the risen Lord and the ultimate promise that we see in the book of Revelation at the very end of Scripture the promise that we will drink 
of the streams of living water that flow from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city. And we will eat from the leaves of the tree of life on either side that draw nourishment from that living water. That's the ultimate promise. When you are experiencing a wilderness experience in your life, a desert place, know that this is the ultimate promise for you. Hear the voice of Jesus who cries out, Come to me, all who are thirsty. Are you thirsty today? Jesus says, Come to me. I am the source. And I will guide you to the spring of living water. Come and drink freely, free of price. You don't have to work or strain. You just have to receive what is on offer for you. For I have thirsted to quench your thirst, says Jesus. I have shed my blood. I am the Passover lamb for you. I have won you back because of my sacrifice. I love you and I cherish you more than you could ever imagine, says Jesus. And so let me fill your heart and let me heal your wounds. Draw near to me as I draw near to you and take hold of the promise of eternal life. This is Jesus' offer to us. It's available at all times and in all places, even right here in this moment. Let us receive it with all of our hearts. Amen.